Hello everyone, today we talk about Mughal infantry during the early modern age, fundamentally up to the mid 17th century. Let's say I already made a video on Mughal warfare altogether, in which probably I already said something about this, but it was, you know, quite some time ago, and now I want to look a bit more in detail the, the various arms, so we will talk about all the various components of of the Indian armies also together at the time because as you know uh, yes the Mughal ruled for you know quite quite a long time on quite a large space but namely but let's say much of the uh, you know of, of the forces that could be levied also belonged to other uh, powers right like you know the higher tribesmen followers of local Rajas and 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 so forth uh, then we will talk very briefly just about the something about the Maratha. There are some um, some some differences, of course, existing between the Muslim and Hindu Indians um, in uh, in outline, right? So you know that the Mughals were established by this essentially like kind of uh, Afghan Mongol dynasty that you know came to uh, to this many many powers in India came to, to rule over this enormous, attractive, you know, uh, agricultural um, pool of the Indo-Gangetic plains and then eventually was kind of swallowed and, you know, trying to, to centralize, <laughs> no, somewhat hopelessly by some level, the Mughals actually were so more successful having a peak, however, you know, being uh, always unstable because of the, the enormous forces agitating within India that eventually, in fact, brought to the... Uh, you know, to the to the final over uh, overthrow. At least, you know, the Europeans entered in, in in the scenario, but still, you know, it was quite some trouble there going on. In fact, with the Marathas themselves. Uh, in any case, that's another thing that we will maybe look at in another video. Talking just about infantry, the Mughal infantry. It's fair to say that it never had as an arm the the same prestige of cavalry, right? They naturally still played a, a vital role, right? We get this idea of India just kind of a swarms of, you know, uh, infantrymen, and numerically this was true, as we will see now for the the levies, the the militias, and so on. But India had since you know millennia before Christ a very heavy mounted uh, bias, right? It, uh, it it came to be developed quite quickly. It's not just about elephants, properly about cavalry on on the longer run, especially that always remained central if you think about chariotry probably in ancient warfare and india is one of those places where chariot warfare was uh, maintained longest because chiefly of this uh, kind of um, it's not much of the presence of heroic warfare per se that historically speaking never quite existed anywhere strictly meant but let's say that this enormous estates in the hands of very few people were extremely powerful and therefore tended to have the training and the equipment to find on on horseback sometimes probably also on elephant back at some point where some ancient heroes are historically documented properly that that did fight when this is shown on on elephant back naturally here in Mughal times things were changing fast especially with the spread of firearms like elephants were still very important it's just the the Marathas rather that you know bring in mostly uh, infantry as a uh, more solid and at that point by kind of western in that case not much necessarily by western imitation but still as a as a general trend because the spread of firearms uh, had made elephants ever more vulnerable right and the traditional archery um, ever less useful uh, as a consequence so having trained militias of, of musketeers was was ever more important and, and that's how the same Mongols uh, started right uh, most um, most Indian infantry at this point was essentially just ill-armed peasants or town folk uh, levied by private means essentially by the local Muslim mansabdars or the Hindu zamindars right so we have looked at the Mughal military organization at some point we already seen how the mansabdars were fundamentally this um, uh, military uh, elite that had you know different layers let's say and that um, kind of overlapped roughly uh, 
uh, from a cultural point of view with, with the Muslim conquerors, right? The, the Hindu zamindars were somewhat the equivalent of it, except they were kind of less framed in the, properly in the Mughal uh, army structure per se, right? Large estates owner that, that, that could levy important forces on their own. Um, and uh, so all these masses of people were just coerced into service depending on, on, on these lords, right? Um, so the only professional infantry that we look at in this time are essentially the uh, the match lockmen that uh, were you know in part uh, already present in fact in, in the Mughal army uh, of the conquest and that uh, remained at that point unavoidably uh, uh, an essential need for for any modern army in these in these contexts. Um, we will talk about the properly the firearms a bit more in depth later, but let's say that having a, a matchlock meant uh, force was essentially the aim of most of these rulers. Except, of course, it, they still worked in a combined force army. Were still, you know, the elephants, for example, were quite important. Cavalry uh, altogether was more important than infantry, right? And, and it's kind of obvious because the firepower of, of the matchlock men, considering the the numbers, the quotas, let's say, in, in the army, in the general training standard that wasn't particularly high, compared at least to Western, uh, to what, what was happening in Western Europe, um, were kind of easy to, to be pushed uh, away just by, I don't know, a cavalry charge, and it was an elephant charge, whatever. And the best match lock men came from the uh, lower Ganges plain and Bengal, right? Um, in the early days, however, uh, only a very uh, few of the, uh, let's say, ordinary infantry, the so-called Dakili, was, were equipped with, with match locks proper. We're talking about one quarter, some say one third, the remainder being infantry archers, which was the standard tradition coming also from the conquerors, right from Central Asia. Uh, the Indians, as you'll see, used primarily at this point composite bows, but um, they were also simple type uh, ones. Um, at some point still the, lo uh, the, the, the bamboo long bows that were there since the time of Alexander. Um, the reason in part being that, you know, the presence of simple bow, quite similar to the Western one, was due to the humid weather that somewhat um, downgraded the performance of the uh, composite one. Um, and the Indians found uh, some, you know, uh, ways to also integrate, however, these other types by you know, preserving it from um, from the watery uh, climate, right? But generally speaking, there was this variation, and and still by this time, in a country that was, mm, of course, modernizing militarily speaking in a strict sense, meaning the introduction of firearms, also you know, essentially the um, also the, the the contact with the Westerners, etc., so that you see. Basically, even in the least documented areas in, 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 in the south of the subcontinent, Europeans documenting, you know, important firepower capacity from the local, uh, from the locals, right? Sometimes with, so with even greater, um, you know, greater capacity, right? They, the, the, it was said, for example, that the Maratha matchlocks, uh, quote, carried much further and infinitely truer than the, the European firelocks. And this was yet another thing because uh, the matchlock remained in India not much just because of, you know, the, the you know relative um, backwardness of the local military culture, but also because it was considered more reliable in the humid weather than the firelock in order to ignite and the, the powder. And this, um, this, this is interesting because um, it's not, uh, like, especially this idea of, here we're talking probably about snipers, right? This is something that the Westerners learned in some ways. I mean, if you even read about the Ottomans, some accounts, I don't know, the, the siege of, of Malta, etc., you see that 
you know, there, there was um, these countries didn't have altogether the same firepower of the Westerners because they were much less infantry based uh, and uh, drilled at that, you know, kind of um, a, a small unit level. Um, but in terms of kind of inventions of firearms, uh, there was quite a quite of a development that was also you know aimed at properly sniping. For example, the the longer um, and uh, heavier also weapon called Jedzile that is um, actually more like a typology of weapons, as far as I understand, was 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 something also. Uh, in in later times, uh, as they were basically non-standardized weapons that were in part born properly as wall pieces, as sometimes they were used also in Europe. I mean, if you pick the musket, for example, at one you know was in Western that emerges in Western warfare. Originally, it was actually artillery. It was considered as uh, at least the, the original design started from this heavier kind of mobile. Um, gun that was understood mostly as a um, as a you know as a sort of heavier thing compared to to the arquebus, uh, etc. And then kind of refined mostly f for for infantry use. Um, but it's interesting, and, it, and and generally speaking, Western sources actually are speaking good terms of the uh, the Indian muskets. There were also calibers right but the former were described in the mid 17th century as small but well finished and this idea that they were kind of smaller um, may be um, proven also by the fact that um, the by other details right um, for example the fact that Indian musketeers were sometimes sitting or squatting to fire which has led to, to the, the idea that um, the uh, the the wooden forks or rests um, were somewhat um, hinged to the gun itself because this was perhaps shorter altogether. So for, for whichever the reason was, I don't know if this is properly, uh, you know, it depended on, it could depend on many th factors. I presume here it could have something to do with the problems of ignition as well and that properly as a consequence of the type of, of the gun it would develop as a consequence for, for its use, right? So, um, and the Indians put some important care in these things because they, mm, they, they, the, the muskets were often inlaid and uh, otherwise decorated, were kept in scarlet or green cloth covers were not in use, were a lot of care for them, probably also because in part they were treasure or something expensive for the local economy. And then there were these um, other kind of uh, jezails that were um, sometimes properly even larger guns, not, not properly uh, sniper muskets, but um, they could be taken into the field on camel mountings, uh, specifically uh, in the mid 17th century the Mughal army included 300 camels so equipped, so it was properly uh, a mounted artillery, which is something that you see I think in India even up to I think the early 20th century in some, in some circumstances which makes the whole thing quite uh, quite fascinating. So obviously, again, showing how the local warfare relied on something more, you know, um, diversified than just the uh, thickly packed uh, musketeer lines, right, to fire and, you know, uh, and, and volleys and so on. In fact, the, the idea is that they, even from iconographic sources, and even from accounts, especially of sieges, etc. The, the, the Indians used these musketeers in a quite um, scattered fashion, right? And also considering at some levels the, the size of their armies and what the, the bulk of them really was, which was mostly mounted, this idea of having all around this kind of skirmishers um, that even probably on the Indian terrain is very varied, but in some cases pretty tough, um, in fact could be more um, useful, or maybe they were just obliged to be, right, in that fashion, uh, having the scattered um, musketeers rather than something more more compact, which, however, surely existed, and also the Mughals, of course, they, you know, trained, especially their guard units, their, probably the statal units, in a much more standardized fashion, a bit more like in, in the Western model. Um, and for the rest, um, infantry served 
for menial functions, right? Um, so as you uh, can can easily um, un understand, like carpenters, blacksmiths, water carriers, pioneers, which seems to be somewhat necessary considering the Indian passion for numbers, right, that was also criticized by foreign observers such, such as Sir Thomas Rowe, uh, looking at the, the this invariable vast crowds of camp followers and the massive paraphernalia of the Mughals camp, uh, the elephant born harem, uh, etc. The wood of course, slow down a big deal the the army in a sense. But if you also think about um, the um, you know the logistical necessities to feed the elephants, these swarms of of townsmen of of, of militiamen, um, etc., that were levied sometimes uh, apparently not having a, even a particular military use could could maybe facilitate paradoxically logistics because where do you even find the, the food for all those elephants in the first place and the elephants are necessary in many ways just for transporting other stuff in turn and to also you know to be employed in, in the battlefield or even in sieges right so the um, um, that that's pretty much it naturally th there was an enormous diversity in the type of infantry uh, especially from an ethnic point of view uh, other inf uh, some infantry was, for example, recruited from the Roilas tribes. It was essentially a Pashtun tribe at the uh, foothills of the um, Himalaya around Rawalpindi. Um, and there was naturally a Mughal connection still with the Central Asian uh, heritage that uh, you know brought in some some important foreign elements. As most uh, Indo-Gangetic rulers, the Mughals, um, uh, also extended their their control on the central and southern Indian territories as a proof of their, you know, uh, universal power over the subcontinent. Um, so, I don't know, by the, the 16th century some warriors were coming uh, from the mountainous deserts of Baluchistan. Um, these fought as infantry archers and on camelback. These were areas that were, were historically influenced by um, Arab Islamic warfare since you know uh, quite a long time. You know the Arabs arrived up to there. Um, the the Ethiopians, interestingly enough, across the Indian Ocean were sometimes mentioned, albeit mostly as palace eunuchs and members of the Delhi police force, which is interesting because this larger Indian cities naturally required some s strong, uh, you know, iron fist order to control the, the masses. The problem in India was controlling the masses, right? And there wasn't, aside from, from the, the rulers mostly hoped to do it from the cities because they were the places where they had the, the greatest concentration of administrative power um, and the least, the most public one in nature. This is this went on since, since the, the beginnings. Um, of of Indian history, let's say that think about a shock and all these things. Whereas the countryside was the real mess, right? Where there was all the the the, the latifundia owners were, and how could you dislodge and like considering how huge India was and how densely populated, etc. Right, and so this thing was always uh, on the move, like as a self, you know, you know, like a being on its own always under the defeat of the Mughals. And during Akbar's reign, many groups in and around the palace are categorized as infantry. And they were many, because the Mughals had a, you know, an, an incredible display of power that was mixing the, let's say, the, the, the Islamic um, ideals with the Indian style and so on. So the idea of this in fact, concentric swarms of people, even around the palace and the various guards layers, something very complex. But, for example, speaking of infantry, there were the Darban porters, the Kitmatiyas, who uh, were uh, the um, essentially special guard units, apparently recruited from thieves and highwaymen, uh, literally. So, even kind of 
you know, kind of a provocation. Um, the um, the Mev Raz or running messengers recruited specifically in what is now Rajasthan. The Shar, uh, Sham Sherpas, the so-called court gladiators, the Paluvans, the court wrestlers, the Chelas, royal slaves, and finally the Kuhart, this, the bears in charge of men carrying litters. So, you know, <laughs> this kind of you know, uh, and they they had like these bizarre functions, namely, but in part were properly trained as effective troops, um, and so there there were also the Ur badges. These were uh, um, the armed women who, gar who guarded the imperial harem, and it's a quite exotic, properly infantry, uh, re remembered as such. Uh, speaking of the command organization, let's say. Um, the Mughal infantry forces were under the, the overall command of an officer known as the Daroga. Um, Akbar's Bandukches, that would be the match lockmen, uh, were in the number of 12,000, divided in five grades. Um, so the, the, the most senior one uh, was essentially the only NCO rank in the Mughal army was the Mir Dabad, the leader of the ten, not to be confused with the um, uh, Dabashi, commander of the ten, which was instead an officer, Mansabdar, um, in rank. And, and the, um, the rest of the uh, Bandukchi Machlokmen were instead divided in pay grades. And uh, this. Uh, I suspect it had because this was a heavy, um, you know, form like this is typical of Indian armies at this point of this continuous hyper segmentation and differentiation of the various units in some ways. I mean, this this existed, of course, also in other armies, but this idea of the caste of the levels of the hierarchy of the universal, you know, swirling around of this of the whole cosmos around the the great Mughal and all these things, um, that this. Diversity represented the the greatness, like the universal reach of and control and you know exact say place of of each one within the within the the community, which was a, a, a very highly ideological and effective thing that is especially typical of India because of the aforementioned difficulties in in establishing a central government without such deep ideological means. And the only other infantry rank uh, uh, was an officer known as the Kidmat Rai, that was uh, at the command of Akbar's Kidmaitia Palace Guards, specifically. So that's still uh, kind of unique. Um, so for the rest were the town and country militias, right? Um, the, the local militia is mostly uh, Hindu, right? They were known properly as the Bumi. Um, they were uh, equipped as police forces, fundamentally organized at a village, a district, or, or urban level. Um, the, the one in the cities were under um, an official known as Kotval, who had a considerable authority, um, given that the the cities, as we were saying before, were quite important for the territorial control of the Mughals, and um, the Kotval had quite an interesting entourage uh, of spies, detectives, that they all were, you know, in, in, in charge of a specific section of, of the town. Um, and, of course, the Kotval was deputed to maintain law and order, um, and this could Pass, however, through also the the kind of kind of religious complicacies of, you know, of the local uh, life. Um, for example, religious fanatics were to be kept out uh, of the cities. Uh, the 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 Kotval himself was in charge properly of putting up the, for example, special illuminations for the local festivals. So of course, as you can imagine, the the religious d divides in in India were highly political, and so that's why these officials were provided properly with own authority to, to keep this under under control. Um, of course, there was a broader military need because you know the the, the 
in the town could be under attack by somebody. But still, uh, there were some other local issues that, for example, mm, invested the Cotwell with the duty to stop from uh, widows being forced to commit the Hindu ritual suicide sati if they didn't want to. And th this is, as you know, what, what's the deal in, in Hinduism that the women are basically burned um, together with with their uh, with the corpse of their husband. And uh, they were originally, you know, it was kind of normal in many ways. You know, India has one of historically one of the most radically violent cultures in the history of mankind. Um, there were headhunters who were still uh, up to the early, you know, 20th century, some areas was quite, quite really a world on its own. And, and the fact that the Muslim Mughal would prohibit this practice, of course, had an important political meaning because it was just like saying, you know, remember that we are essentially an Islamic dynasty over, over an Hindu, uh, largely Hindu population. So um, then uh, the rural district, um, known as Sarkar um, had its own militias, its own militia contingent specifically. Uh, even there, there was uh, some police function under uh, a local official known as Faudar. Now, the Faudar um, was in charge of properly maintaining order in ways that, for example, uh, where you can imagine brigandage and all these things. So he had to, for example, compensate among the various things, any traveler who had been robbed in daylight. Naturally, those who were robbed in, in, in you know, at night, I said, well, you were kind of searching for it because, you know, uh, just in the world, aside from India, like in, in the 16th, 17th century, where right, going around by night, was wherever you, you lived, it was not really a good idea in the first place. Um, and so you didn't you wouldn't even have the right for compensation. Um, so passing properly to the equipment, uh, as we were saying before, the Mughal infantry had a quite a wide assortment of weapons, well, a, a great um, local tradition historically of different of, of weapons. I don't know, bamboo spears, swords, shields, slings, bows, uh, all in so many, many fashions. Some of the characteristics we were explaining before, like, I don't know, the bamboo longbows, uh, or some specific type, you know, very, very customized type of firearms, um, and so on. And the um, uh, daggers, as well, even crossbows, of course, the India had seen the spread of crossbows at the same time. Uh, these were some part of the same weapons that uh, the, the Mughals had properly brought uh, with themselves, uh, and not just, at least some types of them. Um, but India had developed quite a quite a warfare historically on, on its own. Um, the um, the most important role of Mughal infantry was definitely displayed in siege warfare, which was historically very important. Again, for the aforementioned importance of cities of fortresses the enormous agricultural resources and you know labor force available to the to the rulers was used to, to build these gigantic fortifications uh, and you know thus you know armies had to adequate uh, in this um, in this time as well right the India was as we were just saying developing its own uh, artillery over, over time improving all this there was quite of a you know an, an engineering capacity displayed also in the military dimension of course and an infantry was necessary to just blockade the um, blockade the the the, the besieged uh, center um, as always and the um, the the main role uh, was in skirmishes as we've seen in defending camps field fortifications and uh, their equipment uh, consisted also in some uh, waist belts uh, to keep uh, match, flint and steel, bullet pouches, powder flask and priming horns. Um, the, the Indians didn't have the, 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 the bandolier, uh, typical of 
uh, European warfare, right? They they had mostly this this other type of, and it was an in, an enormous variety of 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 military styles that here we just can't simply say, well, okay, uh, you know, you can easily identify it. Uh, India is a multi-ethnic country, has uh, so, so much different communities, uh, landscapes, it's, it's it's very climates and so on. Um, let's say that, um, generally speaking, most most infantry in the Muslim, uh, let's say, forces were still Hindu archers, just because we're more readily available, more than any anybody else. Um, so g good horses were difficult to obtain in southern India. Um, elephants were plentiful instead. So um, armies relied mostly on this, levied by nobiliar power, and so the dispossessed masses could not but fight like foot archers and skirmishers. And that's pretty much it. Um, speaking of the Marathas, though, given that they were coming from a less socially stratified background, if you want even a poorer one, originally, you know, from, from the south, the least developed areas in the subcontinent, but, uh, I mean, relatively so, but still much more comp Compared, of course, to the Indo-Gangetic area, the, um, the 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 Marathas made a greater use of infantry. In fact, uh, Shivai, uh, the famous Maharaja, uh, uh, famously was quote, was credited by saying, "These are my elephants." Speaking of his infantry, um, and. The best were apparently the Mavle from his home hills, some Hasham militia. It was called for the campaigning season. And as we were saying before, there was some good marksmanship among Maratha uh, matchlockmen that was appreciated by Europeans, some, somewhat, that otherwise were somewhat, uh, instead, mm, dissatisfied with the Mughals matchlockmen owned the, the Mughals own matchlockmen that were not well trained. Then later on, as you know, there were also Indians who freely served as mercenaries, also in the European armies were contracted like that. Um, and um, yeah, so yeah, that is pretty much it for today. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.